Welcome, my name is Deborah Walker and I'm speaking to you from Revival from Down Under, which is a Christian church located in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne, Australia. So I'd like to welcome you all here today and those watching online, delighted to have you with us. And today I'd like to speak on a topic that I've called being victorious in the face of fear. Being victorious in the face of fear. And God has given us his word to equip us to be victorious. Hallelujah. And firstly, where does fear come from? The enemy, otherwise known as the devil. And he tries to oppress and dominate. Also, fear can be an emotion. Like, don't walk too close to the edge. You may fall off. Like, there's a natural fear. But that spiritual fear that is an oppression, that definitely comes from the enemy. And even so, we must not allow any kind of fear to dominate us. And why is that? Because you and I have been given the Holy Spirit. That's God in us by his Holy Spirit. And I'm just going to read from my King James Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. And we read here in verse 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That word power is the Greek word dynamis, and it means ability, strength, and miraculous power. That's what the Holy Spirit in us has the capacity to do. It's the ability, it's the strength, it's the miraculous power of God. Hallelujah. Let's read it from the Amplified, verse 7. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, of cowardice, of craven and cringing and fawning. But he has given us a spirit of power and of love and of a calm and well-balanced mind and discipline and self-control. I mean, some people experience such an oppression, they feel like they're losing their mind or they're going to um, commit suicide or having a, a breakdown. The onslaught can be so very real because we live in a natural realm. We live in this natural world and the spiritual world is just as real. And there can be that opposition and it's very real. And what happens is fear gives the devil access to people's lives, whereas faith gives God access to people's lives. So rather than be in fear, God desires us to be people of faith. And fear, doubt, worry and confusion, they do not come from God. So we must not believe those thoughts. You know, they, they, those whispering things, those fiery darts, oh, this is going to happen. And what if that happens? And then what will happen? And what did they think? And what did they say? And all these other things and even worse can be coming to our mind, right? But we've got to remember Jesus defeated the devil on the cross. And he's the head and we're the body. So everything is under our feet. And we're the ones that are seated in heavenly places. We're the believers, which means everything else is under our feet. We're seated with him. Hallelujah. And instead of the devil having his way, we are to magnify the Lord. You know, we've got to start praising him and seeing him bigger. You know, there was a strategy in the Old Testament where they were going against, I think it was the Midianites. It was a great multitude. And uh, the leader of the group, God told them the strategy so he's got his army there. But what did God do? He said, I want you to send out the singers and the musicians first because they make a way in that spirit realm. And they made a way and the enemy was defeated. And that's why when we always start church, we have singing and praise and worship because it pushes back the enemy 
because he wants to bring confusion and division and, and disruption to any meeting and even tries to disrupt people so they don't hear the word. But if we pray and praise and give thanks and glorify God and magnify God, the enemy just gets shut down. Hallelujah. That's how we shut him down. We open up our mouth and I magnify the Lord. Hallelujah. And let's turn over to, back to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And it says here, 8 verse 15. And it says, just a little bit more about the spirit we've received. You have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption adoption whereby we cry Abba Father praise God and the Amplified says for verse 15 for the spirit which you now have received is not a spirit of slavery to put you once more in bondage to fear but you have received the spirit of adoption the spirit producing sonship in the bliss of which we cry Abba Father Father you know so many people um, have uh, broken families or they may be orphans or whatever you or they may not have no brothers and sisters they, they may have lost their parents whatever your situation is when you're a believer you belong to the family of God you're no longer on your own and the family of God is global it's not just a, a local church it's global you're part of a mighty big family hallelujah and and the, that, what that scripture is saying, you are no longer in bondage to fear. Like some people, all their life they have experienced fear. They wouldn't do this because of fear. They can't do that because of fear. It's just, it's just like imprisoned them. But God's saying, no deal. I've given you a spirit that's in liberating you. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Hallelujah. And so God comes to set us free from our past, from our situation, from where to, our bondage is, what even an addiction might be. Jesus came to set us free and give us victory in every area of our life. And as believers, we are to dominate in this life. Let's turn back to Luke chapter 10. And verse 19. And we read here, it says, this is Jesus speaking. Behold, I give you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. All right. That, um, that word power there, it means authority. God, Jesus has given us authority. And over serpents and scorpions, speaking of demon and evil spirits, we have authority over them. And I know, you know, at different times in ministry, you know, we've even walked into congregations and, and particularly when we've been overseas in Africa, they see us coming. They see who we are because light just reveals the darkness and the demons cry out. They just cry out because they're terrified they're going to lose their place of residence. Well, they're absolutely right because Jesus has anointed us to set people free. We have the same anoint. We have the same spirit of God that Jesus had on Him. It's the same Holy Spirit. And so, when people start ducking for cover, I just go after them even more because God wants. Because the demon is what's making them duck for cover, but God came to set them free. And so, praise God. We just try to be led of God, not not presumptuously but led of God and allowing the Holy Spirit to be to use us as he sees praise God and so we've been authority and power and and I'll just read that in the Amplified it says behold I have given you authority there you are authority and power to trample upon serpents and scorpions and physical and mental strength and ability over all the power that the enemy possesses and nothing shall in any way harm you. You know, when Jesus had the crown of thorns, those thorns went into his head and he bore every type of affliction that could come against our mental realm. And Jesus came to give us peace. And so the victory's already been won because of what Jesus suffered. So we are set free to walk in that victory. Hallelujah. And let's turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 
And, you know, we do, the enemy does put those missiles, those fiery darts, we call them. And 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and, and, um, and those thoughts can be very real. You know, I can remember experience many years ago as a young Christian and I, I was, well, I was, I'll explain it. I was, I was driving home late one night and it was, it was late and I was going home to my parents' house and I went through this uh, area and it was quite dark there, but there was street lighting. Even so, the enemy came against me and with such strong thoughts and it was like, saying to me, you're going to have a head-on collision. You're going to have a head-on collision. You're going to have a head-on collision. And it was with all my strength, my natural strength, hanging on to my driver's wheel so that I didn't turn into them. And it was so vivid and it was so strong. And as a young Christian, I didn't even know what I'm teaching you today. And I, all I remember was we sang a song about the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run in and safe. So I thought, all right, that, that's the scripture that came to me. And I thought, right, I'll just start calling on the name of Jesus. Jesus, 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 Lord Jesus, Jesus, Lord. Christ, Jesus, Lord, Jesus, Christ, Lord, Christ. I just said it as many ways as I possibly could because it said the name of the Lord is a strong tower. So I prayed and prayed and prayed and just kept saying that, Jesus, Lord, Jesus. Lord. And the onslaught was so real and I'm hanging on tight. And this went on for about 20 minutes until I got home and just pulled into my parents' driveway and I was ever so relieved to get home. And the next day, my auntie rang. She was Christian, a uh, beautiful woman of God. And she rang to say how I, see how I was, and, uh, which was interesting and just out of the blue. And I said I was very well, but I said I had a very unusual experience the night before. She said, yes, I know, because she said the Lord woke me up to pray for you. And she said, I prayed. She named the hours and that's exactly the time I was on the road. And, and she prayed in the Holy Spirit, made intercession. And so may I just encourage you, when you pray in the Holy Spirit, it says we make intercession for the saints. And so we don't know who we are praying for and upholding. But we just need to be obedient. If God puts someone on your heart, get praying for them. Because you don't know, it could be a life or death situation. So we pray. All right, we stand in the gap and believe for one another. Amen. And uh, just as a, a practical example, otherwise, is have you ever been in bed at night and um, you're laying in bed and then you hear a sound and you're lying there in the dark and the thoughts come rushing in, you know, what was that sound? You know, uh, what caused that sound? Uh, was it a cat, a possum, uh, a burglar? Maybe it was a burglar. Maybe there's someone outside the window, you know. And the thoughts continue. We understand the natural thoughts. And, you know, what should we do? And the best thing we can do if we're in the dark is just turn the light on because light dispels the darkness. And, and that's a great start. And if the sound does continue, um, or perhaps if it doesn't continue, perhaps it was just a cat or a possum just passing through. All right? But we're safe in God anyway. No matter what the sounds and the bumps in the night, we are safe in God. So we have the victory even when we are at rest in bed. Hallelujah. And so if our thoughts that we have don't come to our... Actually, did I, did I say the... Um, did I read the 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5? I've actually read it. Let me just read it. I, we opened to it, didn't we? Let me read it. It says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity everything to the obedience of Christ. Right, So we will have thoughts, but if they don't line up with the word of God, we must take them captive and just cast them down. Don't believe them. Let's read it from the Amplified, verse 5. Insomuch as we refute arguments and theories and reasonings and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God and we lead every thought and purpose away captive into obedience of Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Right. What happens is the enemy tries to lie to us because he can't tell the truth. So whatever he says is a lie. He'll, he'll say, you're going under, you're not going to make it. It's not going to happen for you. Um, and on he goes. There's not going to be enough. And, and it's just that it can be an onslaught. But it's a lie because that's all he knows how to do. But the truth says God's word is the truth. 
And we just need to believe the truth. So if our thoughts or those thoughts that come to us do not line up with the word of God, then we do not believe them and we should just cast them down. Don't take them on board, just cast them down. And we must not be frightened or intimidated. Why? Because God's with us. He's our father. We're in, we've been adopted into the family. And he said he would never leave us or forsake us. And so we're never alone. And no matter what the situation we may be in, God is with us. You know, the three men in the fire, weren't they? They were going through the absolute fiery trial. Life, Their life was on the line, but the fourth man was with them. So even in the midst of our situations and our challenges, God is with us. Praise God. And God has given us his word so that we know uh, his will in every situation. It's, let's turn over to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And it says here in verse 25. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. You know, the word of God is here forever. Other things are going to pass away. And all that you see is going to pass away. But the word of the Lord is forever. And so whatever situation we may find ourselves is, find ourselves in whatever comes out of our mouth actually reveals what's in our heart. Whatever comes out of our mouth reveals what's in our heart because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what we say in any given situation is very, very important. Let's turn back to James chapter 3. James chapter 3, just verses 8 to 11. It says, But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not be so. And verse 11, it says, Does a fountain bring forth, send forth at the same time sweet water and bitter. It's what's coming out of our mouth. And if we turn back to Proverbs, we know life and death's in the power of the tongue, but it says here in Proverbs 12, Proverbs 12 and verse 18, There is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. And the Amplified says, there are those who speak rashly like the piercing of a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. What we say and how we speak to people can bring life and healing. Or if we speak harshly and rashly, it can just cut them, cut them, to, the, cut them to the core. And that's not who we are as believers. We are to speak words of life and health and encouragement to build one another up. Praise God. Hallelujah. And verse chapter 15, verse 4, it says, A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness thereof, therein is a breach in the spirit. And the Amplified says, A gentle tongue with its healing power is a tree of life. But willful contrariness in it breaks down the spirit. You know, I have seen children over the years just broken in spirit by the way they've been spoken to. Maybe their teacher, may even been their parents. There are no perfect teachers. There are no perfect parents. But little hearts can be just crushed by words spoken over them. And some words can just bind a child up because they've come from perhaps some person of authority and they've been weighted in that little heart and that person has grown up. They may be an adult now, but what was spoken over them as a child is still there. And so God wants to heal that and set them free from that. All right. God's into the healing and restoring lives. Praise God. And chapter 16, verse 24, it says here, Pleasant words are as honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. Isn't that beautiful? The Amplified says, Pleasant words are as honeycomb, sweet to the mind 
and healing to the body, right? Sweet words. Let's speak pleasant words over one another and to one another. It brings life. It brings healing. And let's turn over to Isaiah 41. And it says here in verse 10, this is what the Lord says. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, that means discouraged, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. I will uphold thee with the right hand. So <laughs> here's my right hand. So imagine this is me and this is God. He's upholding me in his right hand. And we're in his hand. What a safe place to be. And how big are his hands, if I can say that way? He's got the whole world in his hand. And every life is precious to him. And so he's upholding each one of us. And we don't have to be discouraged. I know there may be situations and challenges, but we just got to remember that he's going to strengthen us and he's going to help us. And we don't have to fear because that's not coming from God. God just wants us to trust him. And the Amplified says, Fear not, there is nothing to fear, for I am with you. Do not look around in terror and be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen and harden you to difficulties. Yes, I will help you. Yes, I will hold you up and retain you with my victorious right hand of rightness and justice. Praise God. He's going to uphold us. Praise God with his victorious right hand. Doesn't that sound great? Praise the Lord. And verse 13, it says, For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying thee, Fear not, I will help thee. And the Amplified says, For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand. I am the Lord who says to you, Fear not, I will help you. Fear not, I will help you. And I can remember years ago, I was contacted by somebody in another state who asked me to go and see their mother in a hospital here in Melbourne. Didn't know this lady and she was in intensive care unit. And I didn't even know if she was a believer or what, just that her daughter had sent through a message. And so I bade the Lord and uh, I went. And um, anyway, this lady was not saved. And so I just went through some salvation scriptures. I mean, I just introduced myself. Perfect. She didn't know me. Just introduced myself and just shared some scriptures, salvation scriptures. I mean, she's all wired up to all the equipment and shared the, shared the scriptures. Uh, faith came and also, and I told her this scripture that it says, God will hold thy right hand. And so I took her hand and I said, now every time you look down at your right hand, just remember that God is holding it. You might be in this hospital in intensive care, but God, God is holding it, your right hand. Anyway, so all the instruments, of course, are all working. They're all monitoring her. And I said, like, you know, I just led her through to salvation. I said, you know, would it be all right if we pray and just get our lives right with the Lord? And yes. And so we prayed together. And uh, she just repeated after me and did a prayer of salvation. And, and then just peace came into the room. And then all the instruments went quiet. And I, because she's got her eyes shut. And I thought, for a moment there, I just thought, had she slipped away because everything just went quiet. And then I realized because the peace of God had come into her heart, all the instruments went quiet. And then the staff came in to see actually what was going on because things weren't bipping out at their station. Everything had quietened. And so praise God. And so the Lord well, um, wonderfully touched the lady that day. And she was taken out of that room. She was no longer in ICU. And so and I did go and visit her again before they checked her out because they wanted to make sure was she was totally healed and totally safe to go back because she lived in country Victoria. And, uh, and, he'd, and he'd done what he needed to do. So praise God, she was saved and healed. Hallelujah. Because God is the saviour and the healer. And he just wants to use anybody who's willing to reach out to others. He wants to use you. Are you willing to be used by God? Because there's a world waiting for each one of us, every believer, to be used, to be made available because someone needs God. There's always, there's so many that need God. Everybody needs God. But that was the Lord holds us by our right hand. So 
no matter what situations we find ourselves in, just remember God's got hold of our right hand. No matter what, he's with us. Hallelujah. And so we need to resist fear, even terror or doubt, unbelief and failure. They're not coming from God. God wants to bless us, encourage us, strengthen us and even prosper. You know, just to, that he wants to use us. Praise God. And Isaiah 51, verse 16. And it says here, And I have put my words in thy mouth, and I have covered thee in the shadow of my hand, that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth and say unto Zion, Thou art my people. Zion speaks of God's spiritual church. We are his people. And he's put his words in our mouth because he's written them in our heart. Praise God. And what's in our heart is going to come out of our mouth. Amen. And we are his people. You belong to God. Hallelujah. And Isaiah 54 verse 14. It says here, In righteousness thou shalt be established. Thou shalt be far from oppression. For thou shalt not fear. And from terror it shall not come near thee. What a great scripture. In righteousness you shall be established. Thou shalt be far from oppression. And thou shalt not fear. And from terror for it shall not come near thee. And that word oppression. It actually means to exercise dominion against. It means to have dominion over someone or to have lordship, sovereignty or to control and so on. That's what the devil wants to do. He wants to have dominion over us. But this scripture says we'll be far from oppression. Hallelujah. In God, not in our own strength, but in God, we're under the shadow of his mighty wings. It's in God. That's the safe place in God. And so we shall be far from oppression and shall not fear. And Isaiah 54 verse 17, it says, And no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. All right, so no weapon formed against you is going to be successful. Not one. Enemy might try, but I read the back of the book. We win. We just stay in, believing through to the end, we win. And we just win day after day after day. All right. And as believers, we are people of faith and not fear. Right? We're the believers, faith and not fear. And let's turn to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. And verse 27 and 28, it says here, only let your conversation, that means your behavior, be as it becomes the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs. That you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. You know, we're not to be in disunity. God cannot bless disunity. We are to walk in unity. Endeavor, what does the scripture say? Endeavor to keep the bond of peace him to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace right we're to be in unity verse 28 and in nothing terrified in nothing terrified by your adversaries which is to them an evident token of perdition but to you of salvation and that of God we're not to be terrified by the enemy right because we're people of faith <sighs> we're people of faith and yes, we do have a spiritual enemy, the devil, and he's the one who causes fear, sickness, discouragement, and so on. But we just understand that's who he is. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That's who he is. But Jesus came to give us life, and life more abundantly, life forevermore. And uh, also, how do we be victorious? Verse chapter James, chapter 4. James, chapter 4. And it says here in verse 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So what was the first part? Submit ourselves unto God. Then we resist the devil. The Amplified says, 
So be subject to God. Resist the devil. Stand firm against him and he will flee from you. Don't come into agreement with what the devil's saying to you. Because Jesus said if any two agree. So don't agree with what the devil's saying is going to happen. Agree with what the word of God says is going to happen. That's who we're to come into agreement with. So we resist those thoughts. We resist that attack. We know we stand our ground and having done all stand. We just stand and resist him. And that word, it actually resist, it means to stand against, to oppose and to withstand. So that requires a choice and an action on our part. So rather than letting the enemy just onslaught, crash, put us over, you know, trying to just, you know, bring us under his dominance and his subjection. No, in God, we're going to stand up, believe God and resist the devil and not let him have his way. It's a choice. We're going to choose God. Praise God. This day, who choose you who you're going to serve, God or the devil. Let's choose God. Hallelujah. And Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 31. It says here, What shall we say then to all these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? And the Amplified says, What then shall we say to all this? If God be for us, who can be against us? Who can be on our foe if God is on our side? No matter what the situation, and there are situations, there just are. It's called life and challenges and God is adjusting lives and he does allow circumstances. And sometimes we put ourselves in circumstances. Even so, if we're in him and we're returning to him, he said he'll work all things together for good to them that love God. And he is for us. So if he's for us, whatever's coming against us is not going to be eternal. It's just passing through. It's just a moment. And so circumstances, challenges are just for a season. They will pass. We know in the natural, after winter comes spring, and sometimes we may find ourselves in situations where it's a wintry situation, but after that, it will pass, spring will come. And if God is on your side, and he is, God is on your side, hallelujah, God is for you. He's not against you. He's actually trying to encourage you. I mean, if we're a bit stiff necked and we just want to do our own thing, well, it's going to get tougher and he will allow that until if we just want to keep having our own way, having our own head and going that way, he'll go, well, I'll be here when you get back. Even though he's with us, he's watching us all the time. He will allow circumstances to get even more tough. If that's what it's going to take to humble us to turn us, to yield to him. All right? So he loves us and he wants the best for every life. And let's turn back to Psalm 27. <coughs> Verses 1 to 6. It says here, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? In my Bible, at the top of this psalm, it actually says, David's song of confidence. That's really good, isn't it? David's song of confidence. Verse 2. When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat of my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this thing will I be confident. And we know with the story of David, all the wars and all the battles and all the circumstances he came in, was involved with, and yet he had such a heart in God, towards God. He was not perfect, but his heart was always towards God. And verse 4, it says, One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide his pavilion in the secret 
of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall sit upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, I will sing praises unto my God. We don't have to be afraid. And God is with us. And he said, one thing will I seek after. You know, we live in a natural world and people are seeking a lot of things. They're seeking this, they're seeking that, they need this or they want that. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with things so long as we seek God first. Because when we seek God first, then he will add the things to us. The thing is, well, the circumstance is, if we keep seeking the things, chances are they may take us away from God. And God doesn't want that. Because we're talking about eternity. We're not talking about this small life just here. We're talking about all of eternity. And so David had it really good there that I will seek after the one thing, the most important thing in his life was his relationship with God. Hallelujah. And, you know, and he, and he did have times of trouble. It wasn't a bed of roses. He did have got times of trouble, but he found a safe place in God, a secret place in God. It's that place of relationship with the Lord. And he said, and, and he was going to have um, offer uh, thanksgiving, wasn't it? Praises to the Lord. Praises to the Lord. You know, he just lifted up his voice and praised God. And like we said at the beginning, when we praise God and give him thanks, because he's given everything that we have, given us breath, it pushes back the enemy. So David just gets praising God and thanking God and seeing God bigger. That's such a key to see God bigger than any situation we're in. And so we have to, that's a choice. We have to take our eyes off the situation and put them on God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Psalm 29 verse 1, it says, so it's Psalm 29 verse 11, The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. You know, it can get a bit wearying in the journey, but the Lord wants to bless us with his strength, right? And, and give us his peace. True peace comes from having a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's peace in your heart and peace in your mind. And it's available in Jesus Christ. And if you haven't given your heart to the Lord, I would encourage you to, to ask the Lord to forgive you of everything you've done wrong and turn to him, turn away from sin and follow God. And when you get your life right with God, the peace of God comes in. And then God wants us to maintain that peace. And that peace remains as we remain connected to him. If we sidestep, turn away, pull back, draw away. It's just not there as it was. We need to stay close to him in peace. And Psalm 33 says, verses 18 to 19, Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him and upon them that hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Praise God and um, keep them alive in famine. Yes, he just wants, let's read it from the Amplified, verses 18 and 19. Behold, the Lord's eyes is upon those who fear him, who revere and worship him with awe, who wait for him and hope in his mercy and loving kindness to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. Well, yes, we often see that as natural death, you know, deliver them from death. But what about spiritual death? People who are dying spiritually because they're hungry for the word. They're in a time of famine. They're not getting fed the word. And spiritually, people can be dying because they're not getting fed with the word. So we need to be feeding ourselves, gathering the manna every day individually and gathering together. Hallelujah. So the, to hear the word of God, to receive communion. And let me just turn back to Psalm 30. It just says here in verse 1 and 2, it says, I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up and has not made my foes to rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried unto thee and thou hast healed me. You know, we can cry out to the Lord. God always hear. hears the prayer of a sincere heart. Always. And God always wants to heal. His hand is always there to heal. The provision for healing has been made. And so God is the healer and he responds to faith 
And so we can look to him, praise God, and get the victory in that area, in health. Hallelujah. All right, let's turn to Deuteronomy 28. This is um, an example of victorious life here. In Deuteronomy 28, we read of God's blessings and curses. But let's just read, um, starting from verse 1, Deuteronomy 28. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently to, diligently to the voice of the Lord thy God. The voice of the Lord thy God is his word. To observe and to do all his commandments, which are command me this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon thee and overtake thee if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Hearken unto all scripture, right? Verse 3, blessed shalt thou be in the city and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy ground and the fruit of thy cattle and the increase of thine kind and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou come in and blessed shalt thou be when you go out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in thy storehouse and in all that thou settest thine hand unto. And he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God gives thee. And the Lord shall establish thee a holy people unto himself as he has sworn unto thee if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways and it all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord and they shall be afraid of thee and the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods and in the fruit of thy body and in the fruit of thy cattle and in the fruit of thy ground and in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to give thee and the Lord shall open unto thee his good treasure. That's the word. The heaven to give the rain upon the land. The rain is the word. Where the land, where the dust, made of the dust. In his season. And bless all the work of thine hand. And thou shalt lend unto many nations. And thou shalt not borrow. And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. And thou shalt be above only. And thou shalt not be beneath, if thou shalt hearken unto the commandment of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day to preserve and to do. And thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day to the right hand or to the left and go after other gods to serve them. <clears throat> In this world, there are many, many distractions and many things we can go after. But we want to have that heart of David, the one thing, and go after the things of God. Because look at all the blessings that come with the things of God. And those blessings are available for every believer. Not just some believers. Every believer. And we just take it by faith. However, you know, this same chapter includes curses. And I'm just going to read, read verse 15. It says, but it shall come to pass if you will not hearken to the voice of the Lord, which is his word, to observe and to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. And verse 21, the Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee until he has consumed thee from off the land whither thou goest to possess. Right, so under the curse is sickness and disease and pestilence is a deadly disease. It's under the curse. And just down in verses 59 to 61, it says, Then the Lord will make thy plagues wonderful, which means um, great and difficult. And all the plagues of thy seed, even great plagues and of long continuance and sore sicknesses and of long continuance. Moreover, he will bring upon thee all the diseases of Egypt, which thou was afraid of, and they shall cleave unto thee. Also every sickness and every plague, which is not written in the book of this law, them will the Lord bring upon thee until they be destroyed. Wow. So the choice, what a choice. And a plague, of course, is a serious infection or an epidemic with a death rate such as a large scale calamity. 
that's all under the curse and the curse comes upon the ungodly. Let's turn over to Amos, which is one of those little books in the Old Testament. Amos, just before Ezekiel, thereabouts, or just after Ezekiel. Amos, chapter 4. And speaking of pestilence, it says here, verse 10 to 13, I have sent among you the pestilence after the manner of Egypt. Your young men have I slain with the sword and have taken away their horses. And I've made the stink of your camps to come up unto your nostrils. Yet you have not returned unto me, says the Lord. I have overthrown some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And you were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning, yet you have not returned unto me, says the Lord. Therefore, thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, which is God's church. And because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. For lo, he that formed the mountains and created the wind and declares unto man what is his thought that makes the morning darkness and treads upon the high places of the earth, the Lord, the God of hosts, is his name you know god calls people everywhere to repent clearly that passage is saying it just was getting worse and worse for those people of god because they weren't returning to god and the the, the more they kept going their own way it just kept getting worse and god's just pleading with them turn back to him and come back under the shadow of his protection and, you know, God, he looks upon this whole earth. He sees every situation. He loves people and he sees where people are at. And yet in Revelations chapters 2 and 3, we read of the seven churches, which speak of the fullness of God's end time church. And seven is the number for fullness and end times. And God calls five of those churches to repent. And that's right down at the end of the book. So God is still calling for repentance in his church because those seven represent the global church because there are things happening in God's church that are displeasing to the Lord. And so God's saying repent. And churches are made up of people. So God searches the hearts. He uses his word because it goes deep into our heart. And wants to bring adjustment to our lives. So we don't perish. He's a merciful God. He loves people and he doesn't want anybody to perish. And you know, we also individually need to have a reverential fear of God. He is almighty God. He could snuff us out like that. We can't presume or assume. We need to honor and respect and have a reverential fear of almighty God. And we were just reading about the plagues, but let's turn over to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. And verse 13. And it says here, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. The Amplified says, Cursed, Christ purchased our freedom, redeeming us from the curse, doom of the law and its condemnation by himself, becoming a curse for us. For it is written in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree is crucified. Jesus Christ, he bore the curse. No one could keep the law. And God knew that. And so Jesus was the final sacrifice so that in him we can come into life. And he took the curse. And I'm going to say it, there are no generation curses coming through the cross. Some people are preaching it, but this scripture says Jesus bore the curse. And I can remember visiting a, a young lady, we met her many years ago, a beautiful young lady in God, loved God, and then saw her many years later, just socially somewhere, visiting someone's house, and there she was, absolutely in a terrible state. She was in a different church and she was in the country. She lived in it and she was now going to a different church and she had this wrong with her and this wrong with her and this wrong with her and this wrong with her. And the, the story went on and, you know, it was just terrible. 
And we said, well, well, what's happened to your life? And she said, I'm bearing the curses, the generation curses of my family. You know, my uncle and my grandfather and my uh, cousins. I'm bearing the curse for them in my body. Well, that's not true, is it? Because Jesus bore the curse. We just read it. And so she'd got caught into a doctrine saying that there are generation curses today. And she was suffering terribly because of a false doctrine. And um, how tragic is that? So we need to have a heart that wants the truth and only believe what lines up with the word of God. Hallelujah. And so we also with this, we know that, you know, nothing could save us um, to release us from the curse because we're all under sin. But when Jesus went to the cross, he suffered every disease. He took every plague. He took every virus. He bore every infection. He took the full weight of the curse just so we could go free of them. Hallelujah. He got the victory. We don't have to be under all that anymore. We just have to look at the finished work of the cross. By Jesus' stripes, we are healed. From God's point of view, when we believe, we're healed. We are healed. We are the healed. We walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith. We walk by what we believe in the word of God, not by what we feel, what we can see. The word of God says we're healed. That settles it. We're healed. And if you're needing healing in your body, just get hold of the healing scriptures. Believe. Uh, declare them, believe them, and re just receive your healing. Praise God. Just receive your healing. Praise God. Now, if we turn back to 1 Samuel chapter 2. Judges Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 2. We read of a lady here called Hannah. And verses 1 and 2. And it says here, And Hannah prayed and said, my heart, so she's praying, right? My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over my enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. What did she do? She opened her mouth. She said, my mouth is enlarged over my enemies. And so victory is assured. When we open our mouths and declare God's promises in the face of the enemy. Jesus, when he was up against the devil and the temptations and testings in the wilderness, what did he say? It is written. It is written. It is written. That's all he, that's every time the test was there. He just said it is written. And so we declare God's word as defeats the enemy. Praise God. And Jesus Christ, the word of God, is the rock we are to build our lives on. And if we anchor ourselves into that rock, even though the wind might, you know, but we, if we're anchored in the rock, we'll be fine. Praise God. And Psalm 34. And verses 1 to 4. It says here. I will, this is what uh, David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. <laughs> Don't you just love that? He didn't say I will bless the Lord sometimes or I'll bless the time, the Lord, only when it's going good. <laughs> he said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Wow. My soul shall make a boast of the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. So he wasn't saying he never had fears because he did. But he, what did he do in the time of fear? He went to the Lord and he magnified the Lord and he sang praises to God. And God delivered, changed the whole situation around. Praise God. And verse four in the Amplified says, I sought, inquired of the Lord and required him of necessity and on the authority of his word. And he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. And as believers, we've been redeemed, purchased from every disease and plague. 
All right, no matter what's been going on, Christ has delivered us. Praise God. And so we need to be like Hannah and like David and speak words that agree with God's word. And if we can't speak good and positive words or uh, good or positive or even God's word, then just keep it silent. Don't don't speak negative things. Don't speak the curses. Don't don't speak what the enemy is trying to get you to say. Just ask God to help you and just open, maybe even open your Bible and just start declaring some Psalms or get the victory scriptures and just start declaring victory in the in the in the middle of the storm. I mean, Jesus spoke to the wind. He spoke to the storm and he said, we can speak to the mountain. If you have a little greater faith and we've all been given faith, he didn't say you had to have big faith to speak to the mountain. He said, if, if you've got faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you can speak to a mountain. Have you ever seen a mustard seed? If it's smaller than a grain of rice, I've seen it. And it's really small, just a little bit bigger than a pinhead, but it's really small. And we're not moving literally mountains like earthquakes, but some people find themselves in situations that are bigger than them. And Jesus said, we can speak to them and see them removed. God's given us authority and power. We read it at the beginning. He's given us authority and power and it comes from his word being in us and coming out of our mouth with faith. Not just lip service, but it comes out charged with faith. And our words are very powerful. And so, and we need to do the same thing with our thoughts or we must cast down every thought that doesn't line up with the word of God. Just don't believe it. As we said, the devil only lies. Maybe even our flesh lies. Because our flesh, our soul, we're still being renewed to the word of God. Our minds, yes? All right, God is merciful. Let's turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 4. God's word wants to, he just wants to help us in our lives. He loves us. He's a wonderful, loving father. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 31. And it says here, For the Lord thy God is merciful God. He will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, which he swore unto them. Praise the Lord. He's a faithful God. He's merciful. He's with us all the time. And if we turn over to Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles chapter 30. You know, because faith comes by hearing the word. That's why I put so many scriptures in. Faith, this, God's word feeds our spirit man. So he stays strong. If you only have one scripture, you know, if, you, if you're hearing a, a topic and you just have one scripture, we need to be washing in the water of the word, which is renewing our mind, praise God, and causing our faith to grow. Second Chronicles chapter 30, verse 9, it says, For if you, re if you turn unto the Lord your if you turn unto the Lord, your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that led them captive so that they shall come again into the land for the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and what not turn away his face from you if you return unto him. You know, how many families, their children have walked away or not saved or whatever. And but God is saying as parents, if you just put God first, just put God first. And then he will cause what's captivating the children to be, they'll be released and they'll come on home. Hallelujah. They'll come home to the Lord. Praise God. So what a wonderful promise. And as parents, you can get hold of that, you know, but you, first the part is that you, we as parents have to turn first to the Lord and then our brethren and children will come on home. Hallelujah. All right. Psalm 103. Psalm 103, starting in verse 1. And it says here, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all thine iniquities, who heals all thy diseases. People believe, you know, most believers that believe that he's, he's healed or he's forgiven all their sins, right? But the same scripture says he heals all diseases. 
So all diseases includes your situation, everyone's situation. Who redeems thy life from destruction, who crowns thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies thy mouth with good things, that's his word, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. You know, sometimes we might find ourselves in a situation and it's things have gone, it's wrong what's gone down. It's wrong. We know it. Others know it. And yet we don't have to fight it because God's the, he's, he's does the vengeance, but he's just and he's righteous. And he's going to execute righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. We don't have to fight our battles. We just have to commit them to the Lord. And God goes in for us. Praise God. And just saying that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We are never to wrestle against flesh and blood. It's always principalities and powers. All right. So take your eyes off that person or those people or everything. It's what was motivating them. They're being motivated by the enemy. All right. Don't fall for it. Just commit it to the Lord. Verse 7, he made known his ways unto Moses and his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. You know, right now, Jesus is on the right hand of the Father. He's the Lamb. He's making intercession. It says he's making intercession for the saints. And so the door is open. The mercy is there. The blood is available. But soon the door is to shut and the lamb is going to stand up and he's going to be the lion. And so it behoves everyone right now to receive his mercy while it's available. Because once that door gets shut, that's, there's no more mercy. It's then judgment's coming. And the, the seals and the trumpets and the vials will start to get poured out. And they'll all get done before he's returned. So... Uh, it's going to get very, very rocky uh, for those not in God. But for those in God, we just got to be on the rock. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So praise the Lord. He has redeemed us. He's delivered us from every form of destruction and oppression. And if we can just get hold of that, we are already delivered. Yes, we go through challenges, but he's already delivered us. He's already t paid the price. And we just commit everything into his hands. Praise God. And Psalm 117 says here, verses 1 to 2. Oh, praise the Lord, all you nations. Praise him, all you people. For his merciful kindness is great toward us. And the truth of the Lord endures forever. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I'll read it. Some Lamentations chapter 3. Verses 22 to 25, it says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. He's good to the soul that seeks him. He is good to the soul that seeks him and his mercies are new every morning. I'll read it from the Amplified, verse 22. It is because of the Lord's mercy and loving kindness that we're not consumed because his tender compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great and abundant is your stability and faithfulness. The Lord is my portion or share, says my living being, my inner self. Therefore will I hope in him and wait expectantly for him. The Lord is good to those who wait hopefully and expectantly for him. To those who seek him, inquire and for him and require him by right of necessity and on the authority of God's word. You know, as believers, well, I was going to say, his mercies are new every morning. You know, I don't know about you, but I've had some days where I'm glad it's not longer than 24 hours. 24 hours is plenty long enough some days. I'm glad we don't have 48 hour days because his mercies are new every morning. Come on, midnight. If the mercies are new every morning, all right? His mercies are new every morning. It's a fresh start. And we leave the day 
before behind and we start afresh. And every day we start afresh. Good morning, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this day. And we're to, as believers, you know, we're to remain in faith, faith and have an expectation. Always have an expectation what God's going to do. And let's turn over to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. Such a great scripture. Mark chapter 9 and verse 23. And it says here, And Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Hallelujah. All things are possible to them that believe. So whatever your situation is, it seems impossible. How can it possibly happen? Whatever. All things are possible. The key is just keep believing. Just keep having that expectation in God. Hallelujah. Because of what he says in his word, and he stands behind his word to perform it. And Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. Philippians 4. And verse 13. And we read here, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And the Amplified says, I have strength for all things in Christ, who empowers me. Isn't that wonderful? He empowers us. I'm ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. I'm self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. We're not depending on ourself. We're depending on the Lord, not by might nor by power, but by his spirit. We're depending on him. And in him, all things are possible and all things can be done. Hallelujah. Now, just down to the end here, 1 John chapter 4. So right down the back, 1 John, the gospel, 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. And it says here, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And you are an overcomer. To be an overcomer, we're going to need situations to overcome. And when you overcome, that makes you an overcomer. And that word greater, greater is he, that means more, greater and greatest. So the greater one, the Holy Spirit, dwells in us. He's the greater one. Greater is he that's in us. Praise God. He's the great one. And so you belong to God and have overcome them. And that's past tense. And the them here, of course, is demon and evil spirits. You are overcoming them. You have overcome them. It's past tense. You have overcome. We've got to see it positionally. We're seated in heavenly places and we have overcome them. They're under our feet. And how have we overcome them? Because the greater one, the Holy Spirit, dwells in us. We're seated in heavenly places. And the Amplified for that verse 4 says, Little children, you are of God. You belong to him and have already, did you hear that? You've already defeated and overcome them, the agents of the Antichrist, because he who lives in you is greater, mightier than he who lives in the world. Hallelujah. So the Holy Spirit's living in you and me. And so greater is he, greater is he, greater is he. Where is he? He's in you and he's in me. He's in here. And 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, it says, For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Hallelujah. And the Amplified says, For whatsoever is born of God, so if you've been born again, right? Whatsoever is born of God is victorious over the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, even our faith. So whatever situation you're finding yourself in, there is victory. You have victory through Jesus Christ. 
And finally, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57. And it says here, But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the Amplified says, But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory, making us conquerors through our Lord Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen.